Good afternoon, everybody in Kenya. Good morning, everybody in Nova Scotia. My name is Eileen Alma, and I'm the director of the International Center for Women's Leadership here at Cody Institute. And I'm so delighted to have you on this call today to talk uh, a bit more about what is going on in Kenya right now, particularly with the COVID-19 pandemic and all of the all of the uh, extraordinary efforts we're making right now as community leaders um, to address the COVID-19. Um, I'm joined this morning also by my executive director, Gord Cunningham. And Gord, do you want to say a, minute, uh, a couple things about yourself? Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I don't think I'll say something about myself, but I would like to say good afternoon and good morning and welcome to, to uh, so many uh, friendly faces. Uh, uh, I know some of you, not all of you, and um, I just I just want to say that you know, um, in this in this these unprecedented times that we are all facing, um, obviously a, a pandemic that is affecting every country differently, um, an economic crisis that is brought on by the pandemic, but has certainly had major challenges for many people before the pandemic. And here in in North America, we are, uh, and, and in many places, we're uh, undergoing an examination of, of racism, systemic racism, um, and, and to a degree that hasn't been seen before. And uh, the degree to which that will be sustained is uncertain, but it's certainly um, an, in, an important moment. Uh, all of this happening at the same time. Um, we are all working from home, everyone at Cody, even though you see the building behind me and the, and the, or maybe you don't uh, on my Zoom. Um, uh, we are working from home uh, and we are physically separated, but we have learned internally at Cody, but uh, and certainly um, all of us are, are feeling the importance just to remain connected socially. And so Eileen and, and many other uh, colleagues have been establishing and setting up uh, Zoom uh, webinars, uh, conversations with alumni, and we've done this in many ways by country. Um, we've, there's been more than a dozen of these these touch points. Um, sometimes by country, sometimes by thematic, sometimes by constituency groups such as women leaders, um, and these are important uh, conversations because they first of all allow us to remain connected, and that's important. They, secondly, they, they allow us to learn more about how each other are faring and to get to gain very valuable intelligence about not just how, as Eileen pointed out, community leaders are responding and how your organizations are responding, but what you think the new normal is going to look like coming out of this, uh, because that is um, going to be the big question. And all of us are scrambling to try to figure that out, but the more we put our heads together, the more... Uh, we're likely to come up with solutions and ways of working that are going to meet the moment. And so uh, these are important conversations for us. And that's why I'm certainly joining um, uh, because uh, we want to remain relevant. We want to uh, make sure that Cody's programming is able to address um, the situations that you're facing now and are going to be facing in the future. So thank you, Eileen, for giving me a moment and um, uh, I turn the floor back to our alumni uh, facilitated by uh, Salome. Uh, thank you, Salome, for doing this with, uh, with Eileen. Great, and Kate, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, and I have to apologize, everybody. Um, I'm actually not in the office for right now. I'm, I'm actually, sorry, I'm not at home. I'm back in the office, but I'm having technical difficulties so now you're going to see me on two different screens at some points because I'm afraid that one of the technologies is going to go down. So, uh, so bear with me. Um, but I'd like to turn over to my colleague um, and our co-host for today, uh, a wonderful human rights defender, an activist, a feminist, um, Salome. And Salome, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what we're going to do today. Thank you very much, uh, Gordon and uh, Aileen, for thinking about us through this webinar. Uh, for everyone who is joining us, welcome on board. I'm Salome Gita, uh, based in Kenya, a GCL 
graduate 2016. And I'm happy to see other graduates. I'm happy to see um, Cody staff members joining us. And also one of my colleagues, Diana, we work very closely, welcome on board. So basically today, we want to look at uh, COVID-19, the impact it is having in Kenya among the communities we work with, efforts that are being put in place by women human rights defenders, individual well-wishers within our country, and understand the environment as a whole, and ask the question of what we can do together as alumni Kenyan members, uh, but also of importance, what can the women of Kenya do together to deal with COVID-19, but also in the future, what would Kenya look like post-COVID and what would be our role. So welcome on board and thank you once more for joining us. Thank you so much, Salome. So if we go to the next slide, um, and Kate, I can't see the slides, so I'm going a little blindly here. But today our conversation will, um, I'm just going to take you very, very quickly through some slides that can help to uh, get us thinking a little bit about what our conversation needs to be today. Um, you know, our, our interest here is to, is to really explore how we can ensure that we are um, being the most effective around our community, our community engagements and to learn a little bit from each other on the ways that our organizations have been responding to the COVID-19 crisis, what kinds of experiences that we've been having, and in particular thinking a little bit about those gender dynamics um, that we are seeing um, with, uh, within our responses as well as within government responses um, that are looking at the effects of women. Um, both informally and informal economies, where we want to look a little bit also as, how, uh, as um, to how we can provide leadership as a group. We don't often get a chance to think about um, collectively what we can do as, uh, as graduates, as Cody graduates, if we were to come together in a country like Kenya. This is an opportunity to share a little bit about how we think we might be able to collaborate moving forward. So next slide. So when we talk about community engagement, um, what, you know, what, we're, what I'm asking you to think about today is what ways are we supporting community-led responses to the pandemic that address issues around public awareness or education, um, around health and sanitation and well-being? How are we handling food security, knowing that so many are in very vulnerable situations with regard to having access to food? What, what are we doing around economic livelihoods um, and you know knowing that um, that the economy has been so dramatically affected by the COVID-19 crisis what what are the what are some of the um, interventions that are being made to address um, the access to work um, and next slide if we look at then in particular in in our work how are we looking at the most vulnerable among us um, of course, when I've been, I'm thinking about those that are historically marginalized groups um, or underrepresented groups like women and children, but also those that are more elderly, those with disabilities, um, and those that are all, uh, likewise also socially oppressed. Um, next slide. In what ways are our, our organizations taking a look at how we influence public policy? So as measures by governments are rolling out, um, either to reopen economies or to address service delivery, what are the ways that our organizations, CBOs and NGOs in particular, engaging with and trying to influence public policy, the decisions that are being made, um, particularly around the COVID crisis? And not just around COVID-19, but how are we also ensuring that other policies that have, that have been brought to bear um, don't have a backward slide. Here I'm thinking again about the gender questions um, that are oft, so often sort of pushed to the side when, when major crises come into play. And then if you go to the next slide, um, one of the questions that I'm hoping we could have a conversation about is collective action. What are the ways that, again, we, are, we have the ability to collectively mobilize 
um, during the pandemic and also as we transition out of the pandemic. Finally, um, another question that I think is always on our, all of our minds as we are leading organizations and as we continue to try to do the good work of our organizations, what are the issues that we are also facing related to our own, or our own stability or our own sustainability as an organization? I, I, would, I would imagine that um, in Kenya, like in so many other countries around the world, many organizations are facing a crisis where they may not be able to continue um, to, uh, to work. So what do we do to ensure that we're meeting community needs that are so, you know, so apparent and so, um, and so um, paramount, but also ensuring the sustainability of our organizations as we're moving forward? That's a big set of questions that I put on the table um, that I, I think would be of interest to really explore. And so now what I'm going to do is, um, is suggest that we turn these slides off for now so that we can really open up the conversation. And what I'd like to um, suggest is that um, Salome, as our co-host, lead the discussion. She could anchor it by uh, sharing a little bit of what she's seeing being the context right now in Kenya as well as speak to a little bit of the work that she's doing. And then we will open it up for conversation uh, amongst all of you. So back to you, Salome. Thank you, Aileen Alma. I think one of the things we need to mention is basically the environment that we are operating under. And uh, allow me to mention a few things that we have seen happening, uh, which affect different communities. For example, COVID uh, kicked in at a time when we were in a rainy season. So we had communities that were hit hard by the rain, but also hit hard by COVID-19 uh, to the level that uh, because of floods, many of them uh, had to be displaced, homes broken, yet they didn't have anywhere to move to. That really affected part of the Western uh, region of Kenya. In Nairobi, we saw a bit of eviction happening. Uh, two areas were basically hit hard. And again, communities here were forced to spend uh, nights out. And some of them up to now, they have not gotten a place to stay. Uh, because of COVID-19, again, we experienced curfew as a way of containing the effect. Uh, some major towns were locked down completely. Uh, Nairobi is one of those towns uh, that was affected. And up to now, up until the 6th of June, we were added 30 more days, which meant that people within Nairobi cannot move outside to venture to other towns. And therefore, economically, then all of you have to operate within Nairobi. Uh, our education has equally been affected because uh, since March, when schools were closed down, uh, then kids are operating from home. Those who are expected to do their final exams at the end of this year, we are yet not sure whether exams will happen, but the government communicated that uh, by September, we will see children going back to school in a staggered manner. So we are left uh, assuming probably those who are expected mm -hmm. to take their exam will, are the ones who will report in uh, September. Uh, the last aspect is lack of basic things like water. Uh, water in most uh, major towns uh, is only available in a number of days a week. And as is expected, one way of dealing with COVID is that you are expected to wash your hands regularly. So without water, that basically means you are not able to deal with COVID as directed. Finally, for those communities living in informal settlements where basic uh, services are not uh, available, they are basically worst hit. Well, for starters, social distancing in informal settlements is not uh, uh, a possibility. So people are trying their best to uh, follow the directives, but you realize that the environment uh, is not uh, 
facilitating uh, such communities to deal with the situation. So in a nutshell, those are some of the issues or some of the things we are seeing happening in Kenya. I'm sure um, the CODI alumni members who are here, they'll get an opportunity to also add uh, what else they are seeing happening and what this then means to communities. Uh, the organization I work for basically uh, seeks to support human rights defenders. And during this period, the defenders are busy monitoring violations of rights that are happening within the environment that I have explained. And uh, they found themselves in trouble with both state and non-state actors, because when they tell, uh, tell it as it should be, then they are targeted. A good example is the defenders who are monitoring the evictions taking place in Nairobi. Uh, one woman defender was actually sent threats to her life because of, of publicizing what was happening. So we are supporting them, we are supporting human rights defenders to monitor human rights violations in the 47 counties of Kenya. We have done a report to that effect. We have supported women groups, CBOs, uh, with uh, training on how to make liquid soap. We have facilitated them to buy chemicals so that they can make soap and uh, distribute within their communities. And we have also supported some communities to buy water tanks so that when water supply has been cut short, they are able to have uh, water within their communities, which then they can use to wash their hands. We have thirdly put up murals in uh, two informal settlements in Nairobi as a way of creating awareness on what COVID is all about and some measures they can start putting in place. Some of the murals, you, you'll be able to see them in the photos or you are able to see them in the photos. And um, we are doing this in collaboration with human rights defenders who are scattered all over the 47 counties, simply because movement is one of the challenges that has come up you're not able to move outside Nairobi. So to do your work, you need to rely on uh, networks of human, human rights defenders who are in the 47 counties. So Alma, uh, basically that is part of what we are doing and the environment under which we are working. Back to you, Alma. Yeah, thank you very much, Salome. Um, and some really interesting interventions, but one of the challenges that I that I hear um, and that we you've uh, you've discussed is really the the lack of mobility for um, for human rights defenders to you know to correctly do the work that they do. And so numbers, um, you know, it's it must be very difficult to try to capture numbers and and cases uh and and really understand the 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 massive effect that the pandemic is having on women's lives right now um do you have any sense of what the what the figures or the rates are in terms of um gender-based violence um now in kenya and in, in in um in comparison to where it was um prior to the pandemic outbreak yeah i would say for those of us who have been looking at the newspapers, watching news, the numbers have actually increased. As of uh, last month, um, I think the third week of last month, the numbers were reported at 157 compared to last year, same time, where the number stood at 47. These are figures that are being reported by a network of women human rights organizations that have come together and they are basically monitoring sexual gender-based violence. Looking at our report, we were able to report about uh, 13 cases and my colleague Diana may uh, confirm that on chat. We were able to report 13 cases of sexual gender-based violence reported in two counties. And these are cases that are coming to us, despite the fact that our mandate 
uh, is not about sexual gender-based violence. So the second challenge I want to cite is the fact that uh, most organizations are based in major towns in Kenya. And the challenge that defenders are facing is that when violations occur within their locations, they, are not, they do not have a fallback mechanism where they can report to. So they are sending this information to us. And in return, what we are doing is that we are sharing these cases of gender-based violence with a network of organizations. Among them is the UN Women and uh, one of the leading organizations that we collaborate with called CRU. So whenever we get a case of uh, SGBV reported to us, we are forwarding this to the, this coalition. The mm -hmm. third challenge is the fact that we do not have safe shelters during this COVID period because most of the hotels have been locked. If you are to set up a safe shelter, then people fear that whoever is being brought to this shelter probably has COVID. So they don't even want to socialize with these people. So one mm -hmm. of the things that CRU and UN women were doing was to develop guidelines, which then they were supposed to present to parliament to be approved so that they can set up four shelters in Nairobi. And those shelters were supposed to start running starting June, which would mean in Nairobi, cases of sexual gender-based violence would have a way of being mitigated, and therefore victims would be taken in into this shelter. However, outside Nairobi, these cases, victims still do not have a place where they can run to, and they would end up putting up in the same houses where they are being violated, or moving to a friend's home where, again, challenges of where to put up food and everything else would then pile up to whoever wants to support them. So, Alma, that is one of the challenges that is being faced when it comes to dealing with cases of SGBV, which are ex escalating on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn now to the um, graduates that are on the line. Um, and I know that there's a few of you that are not based in Nairobi. Um, one of those is Dolphine and Yango. Um, Dolphine, I wondered if you wanted to share a little bit about what's happening in your community right now. Are you there? And can you can you hear me? You can yeah, just take yourself you. off. Mute. Perfect. Thank you, Dolphine. Go ahead. Welcome. Hi, Eileen. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I'm based in uh, Kericho, actually. I, I work in Kericho, but I do most of my work in Kisumu. So when Salome mentioned the, uh, the fact that there were floods uh, early in the year around, uh, no, just around the time that the, the lockdown was announced, that is around March, April, we find that so many families were affected and they had to move out of their homes and probably go to uh, social places like uh, schools and churches where they were really overcrowded. So the idea of physical distancing and social distancing actually was just a myth. That is, the families were really, really crowded. They had no food. They had no proper place to sleep. Sanitation was terrible. And then I want to zero down on uh, menstrual health hygiene. So when it comes to now um, looking at the uh, through it, uh, looking at the gender lens, the females have got to deal with menstrual health, uh, health hygiene, even during these times of COVID-19. So you find that uh, most of the girls we work with are very vulnerable. And when they're in school, that's the school, the school environment is a safe space for them. But find that during this time when they are at home and during this time when there's a lot of flooding and crowding in schools and all that when they're looking for shelter, 
we find that dealing with their menstrual health hygiene was a really, really big issue. First and foremost, most of them did not have the proper uh, materials uh, like sanitary pads and so on to take care of their menstrual hygiene. Water was a problem. Safe spaces to change and bathe and so on was a problem. And then also cases of rape were being reported and uh, sexual violence in such spaces. So that is one area that I think um, we really, really need to think about. Because apart from all other issues that the females face, there's this big issue of the menstrual health hygiene. Mm -hmm. Delphine, let me ask you also, I mean, those are really important uh points that you're raising, uh, particularly for women and girls. I'm thinking about also the economic side of things as well as the education sector. And you just mentioned schools and, you know, obviously the shutting down or the overcrowding, depending on the circumstance, um, uh, is, is prevalent right now. Um, what, what do you see is happening for you? I know you're associated also with the university there. What does that mean for the university and, and also economically what's happening in, in your area, in, in whether it's in uh, Kiricho or it's in uh, Kisumu, what are you seeing in terms of economic, uh, economic shifts? Okay, the economic shift, you find that most of the groups we deal with or the women we work with are women who are in small scale business. This has really been affected because first and foremost was the issue of the curfew. So you find that like most of them would, uh, uh, would, would, would before the curfew was, was, uh, was announced, we find that most of them would work like late in the evenings, they sell vegetables by the roadside and so on. So this was greatly curtailed because they had to rush home early and this really affected their business. Then you find that the source of income is now was is now very very unstable. Most of them cannot do their business as usual, and then you find that even the movement of uh, trucks or uh, the movement of lorries that deliver produce where they go by and and do retail, you find that the movement has also been highly curtailed because of the calf, the curfew issue and so on. And then when it comes to the education sector, there's a lot of anxiety, as Salome has already mentioned. We are not really sure what is going to happen in the education sector, especially for the candidates who are supposed to graduate from primary school, some to graduate from high school, and the ones who are supposed to graduate from the university. We find there's a lot of anxiety because they had to cut short. We had to cut short the education program to try and flatten the curve. So the uncertainty, the anxiety is very, very high. And also most of the small scale traders, actually most of the people, uh, most of the Kenyans who are involved in retail trade as small scale traders, with, the issue, with this issue of the curfew, we find that the number of hours where, when they can operate has actually been reduced. And this has actually adversely affected them. So mm -hmm. the economic crisis is there, especially for small scale businesses. Right, and the curfew um, what was from what time to what time every day in Kisumu? Initially it was from, uh, sorry, initially it was from uh, dusk, to, dusk to dawn, that is 7 p.m. to 5, uh, 5 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. But on, uh, was it 6th of June? The hours were reduced, the, cash, the curfew hours were reduced. Now it is from 9 p.m. in the evening to 4 a.m. in the morning. Right, and that's national, is that right, Salome? That's across the country, the same curfew times? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you yeah, very much, Phil. It's the national curfew. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to see now if um, Jacqueline is on the line and Jacqueline did, brings a different perspective as well, being also in the in the media space. Um, Jacqueline, would you like to um, share some thoughts from your side? Hi, everyone. Hello. 
Yeah, I came in a bit late, so I am not really sure what uh, Salome has touched on or what he has, he has not said, but um, I think I agree with what uh, they have said and what is going on. And I'm also happy because I can see Salome is very proactive. The other day he was in our station talking about the same thing. So <laughs> that's very commendable. So it's hard for women actually. And what is more heartening is maybe like the case that where uh, there was eviction and the whole area was, was put down. So there are women and small children who are just staying in the cold. So you can imagine the challenge we are facing about COVID plus now that eviction, so people are sleeping outside. We don't know now what to, to look at. Is it the, the disease or is it the now they need to look for how to get shelter, how to get food. So those are the challenges that uh, we are facing. But also something, I don't know, it's very strange what is going to happen is like yesterday, the Minister of Health said that uh, people are now going to do the home-based care. If you are, you, you are found with the disease and in Kenya, so many people are symptomatic, you are going to be taken care from your house. Now you are wondering about people who stay in the slums or in the informal settlement, how they are going to deal with all that. Mm -hmm. It's still a challenge and a very big challenge to all of us down here. And Jack, Jackie, how, how have you been, um, how have you been working in terms of the, the kinds of work you do in the media? What are you seeing right now in terms of trends there? We often see um, media is also being frontline essential workers in many ways. Is that the way in which you are you are experiencing that in uh, in Kenya as well? Yeah, still the media is on the front line, and uh, some of some journalists still go to the field and they don't have the the essential PPEs. You can see a reporter in a hospital and they, they are not really armed up. So. We are thinking there are rumors that some media houses, uh, we have journalists who've already contacted uh, the COVID-19, but it is, uh, it's not coming out clearly because they know if they just say now, people will now refuse to go to the field to, to get the stories. But what the Media Council of Kenya is doing is to argue the media houses to equip the journalists who are going to the front line. For us, for me, I don't really go to the field, but my colleagues who go to the field, they have tried to be given those kits, but they are not really enough. The government, the media houses are saying it's very expensive. And now that there's no advertisement, not going to work, also many journalists are facing a lot of job losses around here. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in my case, where the programs I produce, we are doing them in the studio. So we are limiting studio guests. Maybe if it is just one person to come to the studio and pass the message. But most of the time we are using the Zoom and the Google Meetup so that we can be able to inform our audience on what's happening. Mm -hmm. And in, in many ways, there's probably a, quite a bit of innovation that might be happening um, around the COVID-19, the way in which media has responded, the way you get the stories out, the way you try to capture the information. Um, it, it, there, there's, some, there's some degree, I think, there of, of, uh, of really creative ways of looking at journalism. I, have you experienced any of that, uh, Jackie? Anything that you find is kind of fascinating that has kind of shifted the way media is thinking? Yeah, especially on inviting guests in the studio. We were saying maybe after COVID-19, we want to be able to convince a guest or an expert to come to the studio because they'll tell us we've been doing all this through Zoom, through Google Meet, why do I need to come to the studio? So you are saying now, I think it will be it will be the end of us having studios in the guest. Mm, very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to turn to another graduate that's on the line. I'm and I'm trying. You're going to have to forgive me if I'm missing people, but um, and raise your hand if you'd like to to share something. But I see that Mary is on the line, and Mary, I wanted to know if you would like to. Um, to say a few words about what you've seen and you're experiencing and, and the work that your organization is doing. Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to be part of this conversation today. Um, yes, I work with the families of children with disabilities 
and uh, for this period it has been a bit difficult uh, because um, like for our organization uh, we, we are unable to do anything for now because one we work we work mostly with volunteers and also we work with well-wishers and most of the people who help us in one way on, or another uh, they say that their budget is tight and there is uncertainty so they don't have like extra money they can chip in to help in one way or another mm -hmm. uh, some are not even sure there's a time i was following up someone who needed to donate some food and and give some money but after pursuing them uh, they withdrew they say that they are not sure uh, about if the money is going to be used uh, the right manner how the food is going to be given to the right people so there is that also people are fearing to donate maybe they are thinking uh, people are going to use it in their own way because uh, everybody is in need even the people who have been given maybe they think also they are in need so but i've been like trying to talk with the, the families and there are some challenges that they are facing like food is one main challenge uh some mostly who have uh, smaller children sometimes they will just get one meal for the child so because the mothers who i work with mostly do casual work so they have been telling me now they cannot go to the middle class settings or the high class setting to do the the jobs because they have been told uh, they cannot come to the houses they bring in COVID to their houses or to their surrounding so it's hard so they have no jobs at all at all so also other thing is the healthcare services most of the children used to have like therapy uh, services maybe once a week twice a week or twice a month so they cannot go so the most of them i talk to they are not going for therapy so their children are not receiving therapy services uh, for now so if they don't know how to do maybe home-based care therapy they are unable to do anything to their children for now and um other something else is uh, they don't have protective like gas mask or sanitizers even water is not enough actually in nairobi like uh, the area i live we have not been having water one there's maybe you have water but not every day but there's a place a year there was no water almost for three weeks so you can imagine so there is no water uh the people are poor they have no even money to to buy sanitizers or mask uh some of them say i cannot buy a mask that five dollar i get i would rather buy food than buy a mask so so they say i'll better eat than die because if i wear a mask i will still die so i first have to eat than uh, yeah, to to protect myself so those are the things that we have been dealing with so that's where we had for now so we are just stuck there <laughs> we don't know what to do but we are still trying to see how we can we can uh, lobby and maybe see who can help in any way yeah mm -hmm. yeah thank you mary i think the the important work that you're doing um, with children with disabilities um, you know, makes me think of some of the communications that we've been seeing, um, you know, uh, here in Canada, but also in other parts of the world about persons with disabilities being forgotten, um, not being considered or counted in terms of thinking through the strategies. Um, um, you've mentioned some of the challenges, particularly in getting therapy, but also just basic human needs like food um, are, are, you know, quite significant. Um, I would imagine also that there's the the question around education and how yeah. children with disabilities have access or don't are you know has there been um, from your from your government's perspective in terms of policies or 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 um, or services has there been very much um, that you've seen by the way of the government in terms of uh, implementation of particular supports for persons with disabilities or has that been sort of off to the side? And are you doing any advocacy work in that area? Um, I, I don't know. I think they are in a worse uh, place than the, 
the, the other uh, group of students, but also Jackie can help me there. But what I know, there are some private schools who have been trying to have some conversation with also parents, with children with special need to see how they can be. Um, they can be incorporated. For example, many of the children are doing maybe online work, they are using Zoom, using internet, but the special needs have uh, special challenges. So they might not even be able to use those gadgets or if they are using them, they need someone to assist them. So there's even more work with them, even if they will have the, the education uh, tailor-made for them to to receive it at home, it will need an extra care, an extra aunt, mm -hmm. or someone who will who will help them or support them to be able to do what they need to do. Uh, but for the government, I've not had much. Maybe Jackie can help me also there. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much, Jackie. Did you want to make an intervention? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. For okay. For the first time, I can give credit to the government in terms of passing information. Information. My internet is unstable. Okay. okay. I was saying for the first time, I can give the government credit for what it's doing for persons with disabilities in terms of providing information. We have received memos like all media houses. No uh, giving out of public service announcement without sign language. That will help those uh, people who are deaf to be able to get the information. And also, uh, I'm also passionate about that disability issue. And because we don't see a lot of disability stories in the media, so for me, what I've tried to do is also do some promos or promotions to show, to raise the voices of persons with disability in the media. And I've just shared one of the videos I've done in the, in the Zoom group chat, you'll be able to see. Because it's just showing that also people with disability are existing, and this is how they are surviving through the COVID-19 situation. But I still have to admit the way uh, Mary is saying, it's still hard for people with disabilities who are in the, in the informal settlement, because you can imagine we are being told about social distancing. Someone who is using a white cane, he needs a guide. Someone who is using a wheelchair, the, the wheelchairs in Kenya, most of them are not automatic wheelchairs. So they need someone to push them. How do they go about? So if it is sanitizers, they need double sanitizers. If it is, uh, if it is, uh, uh, if it is transport, they need, they, everything is double for them and it is very expensive. The National Council of Persons with Disability has tried to map now the people with disabilities and try to give them help, but still there are some complaints of people saying it's not really enough. But for the first time, I can say the government has tried, especially information, providing information to persons with disabilities. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for adding it to that. Um, so lots of uh, lots of really. Yeah, I think um, I'm done. Thank you, thank you, Jacqueline. And I think there's a little bit of a delay because of the connections and I'll, I'll just also apologize to people that I'm actually doing this call from my cell phone because my internet is unreliable in Canada. Just in case you think it's only in, uh, in Africa or in parts of Kenya that you, that you have uh, unreliability, it also happens here in rural Nova Scotia. Um, I'm going to now um, see if, um, if Lisa, who's on the call, Lisa is a partner of Cody Institute She's working with ICRAF, and uh, I know that they they have some significant programming in in Western Africa, particularly around climate change adaptation. Lisa, could I ask if you'd like to share a little bit about the work you're doing and what you're seeing right now in terms of uh, the effects of the pandemic on that work? Hi. Hi there. Hi. So good to see you all and to listen to, to you. Um, I'm trying to be very brief and perhaps we should ask Victoria, although I'm not sure how good her connection is, um, who is working in our project in the field in Western Kenya to give some more um, updates. Ah, someone wants to come and say hi. Can say hi. <laughs> um, so we have a climate change adaptation project in Western Kenya, so mainly agricultural development, and we use ABCD um, in, in various ways, especially ABCD and also all the producer-led uh, value chain tools 
with the objective of establishing a better relationship between like an external actor such as us and, and communities to understand how we can support them better. So the, the idea basically is that we do the entire ABCD, like we, we have our own adapted way of how we're doing ABCD to make sure that we basically mobilize three different three different outcomes if you will so the the idea is that obviously like as we all know like this the self-dignifying the self-evaluating the self-assessments and all of these things with the objective that a people understand like groups of people understand better how how they can mobilize themselves and what they have to achieve their own development objectives completely by themselves how, and that they understand better like which potential support actors they have by having like a very comprehensive institutional and association assessment so that they understand really like which actors are out there with whom can we collaborate who among us knows whom within which external institutions and, and actors to really get targeted support for specific things that are required within the community and then like in the third in the third lane that they understand like ecraf as an agricultural research organization as a specific kind of partner from whom a specific kind of support can be requested and with whom collaboration will be efficient and effective and also like beneficial for us if you will if communities understand exactly what what our profile is like what our what our offer is what our mandate is and and there's like an we call it like matching of interests and and, and identities and preferences in terms of how we can support them with them with the things that they're really interested in without us presuming that whatever we can bring to the table is everything that matters to them. So the idea really being like self-assessment, uh, much more awareness of like who, who is in the playing field around us, who are the, our direct neighbors, the people in our community with whom we can, whom we can discover in so many new ways. Because very like one thing I often say is that typically people interact with each other based on five or ten percent of the knowledge that we have about this person, and very often we really don't know like how much we could still like achieve just us together if we spoke more and if we interacted more in a meaningful way. So so that's what we do basically. So as as an institution, ICRAF is is um, is an international agricultural research institute um, focusing on agroforestry. So agroforestry has to do with sustainable agriculture and the purposeful introduction of trees on farms for various purposes. So that is like the underlying mission, if you will, that our institution is pursuing. Um, but then like us as a project, we, we have like a wider livelihood diversification, like sustainable livelihood divers diversification objective. But in an ABCD logic where we don't just come with like a predefined um, predefined activities, predefined agenda, but we really try to develop our agenda jointly with the groups that we're working with and to make sure that we support them in the things that they're really interested in. So and just like very briefly in terms of the current crisis, it's it's interesting. So as as we... I love it. Thank you. Thank you. In terms of the current crisis, there, there are so many aspects to it, obviously, and Salome did a really good job of like resuming the things that are really important for, for the wider society. But there are so many, there are so many aspects in, in, in so many areas of life. And for example, for us specifically, as, as people working for an institution, our institution officially closed or asked us to work from home two and a half months ago. Um, so for the last two and a half months, it has been home-based home, home -based work. And also for the people who... I love... Keep it, keep it, keep it. And also for the people who work on the, on, in the fields, such as Victoria Langat, who I don't see anymore, who tend to have connectivity issues as well sometimes. Um, since we have a ban on any kind of gathering, we are not able to do any work anymore on the ground. So a lot of, a lot of work that they continue doing, which would... It has shifted, if you will, and has become much more virtual. And it's interesting, like how us as urban-based people, we we got very used to having Zoom calls and all of these things instead of having like face-to-face -face meetings. But in, in in rural areas, that deconstructs in different ways, if you will. Um, and one thing that the that our our field team really report is that WhatsApp groups have become really important. 
And what they do is that they try to stimulate people to exchange. Like, so we, we have like a, a project wide WhatsApp group where they interact with people and where they really encourage people not only to share their, their difficulties, but also to share how they're finding solutions. So that there's this virtual platform and it's just very simple, but that they really like continuously encourage and also monitor and try and connect people to each other when they see that they have solutions and that they have like interesting strategies they're pursuing without them being anywhere near to see it. Um, just that I've, I found that interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then just perhaps like two, there, there are so many things to say, but perhaps just like two more comments about like si- things that I find particular in our, in our context is um, as others have said before, there there are like so many things that are complicated. And in in my understanding, while it is true, honestly, that the Kenyan government reacted very fast. And despite the fact that we do see a lot of issues with abuse of power going towards human rights issues, like very serious ones, it's starting to come up. And in the beginning also of the enforcement of the curfew, there has been a lot of police brutality, etc. Um, we've had issues when people are defying the curfew that people, I think like 35 people have been killed so far because of defying the curfew. Um, so like while all of this is true, like the government really did react very fast. And many, many of us, we do believe that the government managed to, to decrease the, the speed of the, um, of the spread because of doing that. But like two things I just want to say that I find very complicated. Number one is that we have mandatory quarantine in government facilities. What does that mean? It means that any person who is tested positive has to go to a government facility until they're cleared of the virus, whether symptomatic or asymptomatic, whether able to self-quarantine or not. What that leads to is that people are really hesitant to get tested. People are even so there's there's like an issue of government capacity of testing, and at the moment they're they're testing something like two and a half thousand people per day, I think which is really not a lot but even in areas where they are setting up like um testing points because they are known to be hotspots people are just really hesitant to get tested because if it means that you're being dragged out of your family that you're being placed in a in in a government quarantine facility and and some of like typical most of the government quarantine facilities are high schools so people sleep in dorms together with like tens and hundreds of other people I'm, I'm not very sure, like I'm, I keep wondering about like whether we have any kind of reports, but there must be issues, especially also gender-based based violence issues in those war- quarantine facilities. I can't imagine that that is not happening if people are sleeping in, in, in open, in open uh, dormitories with people they don't know. Um, so I think there has been like a, re- a real hesitance of people to get tested and to get help and how that manifests is that um, we do have people dying alone at home. And I'm mm-hmm. sure that they know that they have an issue, but as as one of the other contributors said earlier like for many people it is really a question of do i pursue my health or do i pursue my attempt at having something to eat tonight and it, it's a big issue so the government is trying to roll out home-based care possibilities which of course is also challenged by the fact that many people do not have safe homes to go to but at least they're, they're yeah at least like many, many of us feel that there should be a possibility for those who can to get home-based care, especially since apparently, I think it's 87% of our cases are asymptomatic, especially now also in the context of the WHO saying that most the asymptomatic cases don't actually spread so much. So that like that is one thing that is complicated. And then just to respond to another issue that was raised earlier. Yeah, about- and, then, and then I'll turn after that to back to Salome for a minute. Go ahead, Lisa, what's your final point? Okay, my, the final point I just wanted to talk about was about the question of donations and distribution and, and helping. Mm-hmm. So as you can see, I am one speci- a part of a particular minority um, within the country. Um, and there, there are people around me, people who you know have stable jobs, who have been able to keep their jobs and have been lucky to keep their jobs and people are really wondering what they can do because social social justice is a big issue here in the country as we all know so there are really many people who are able who are really trying or really thinking hard about what they can do to support and to help but there's really this double issue that was addressed earlier on the one hand so initially in the very beginning 
it started happening that there was like a complete spread of people randomly, you know, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but people ex discovering their charitable side and all of a sudden starting to cook outside their homes and then noticing that hmm, perhaps it's not that easy. So there was like a real, a really chaotic situation initially where people would try to do good but really create a lot of stampedes mass panic people like coming so many fam families coming so that they, they started like the, this issue of how do you organize support how do you structure it how do you select who, whom to support etc all these issues started coming up and then the government established a I'm not very sure what the, the legal entity is, but the government established like an attempt to control and coordinate all kind of donations that are being done. But especially in our context, again, people don't trust the government to actually do something with the money. So there's like this big divide, if you will, where people really do want to help, but many people struggle to find ways of doing so because they don't want to support the initiatives that might you know, also contribute to a lot of dependency and very selective support of specific people that can then again lead to social justice issues. And on the other hand, there's lacking trust in the government to handle it for, for people. So I just wanted to address that and I'd be really interested also in knowing like what other people on, on the call think about, think about that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you Lisa. Um, some very important interventions there, um, particularly in, in seeing um, you know, some of the challenges vis-a-vis uh, -vis the charitable side, as you've just pointed out, but also so many other other elements that you've raised. I want to turn back to Salome. Salome, you, you've you been listening carefully to some of the interventions, and we still haven't heard from uh, a number of people, and I'm going to turn to them next, but do you have any thoughts, anything that's kind of coming to your mind, um, having heard from, um, from Dolphine, from Mary, um, from Lisa, from others? I, I want to pick from um, talk mentioned the issue of home-based care and everybody else has mentioned mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. because I feel this is an area that uh, needs to be well thought out and it is an area that I think the team, uh, the alumni team members here should start thinking about because we all know women are the caregivers. So if we are going to take the route of home-based care, the question I would want us to start asking ourselves, currently the numbers in Kenya are indicating that men are more affected by COVID. So every day when they report to us in terms of numbers, men are the majority. So with home-based care and the fact that women are the caregiver, are we likely to see numbers of women in Breathing in terms of those affected by COVID. And mm. if this is the case, what needs to be put in place? The government is talking about uh, coming up with guidelines on how home-based care would uh, be managed. So we need to think from a gender perspective, what would this mean for women? What would it mean for women with disabilities, women living in, in, in informal settlements? so that we don't just come up with guidelines that assume that women across the board um, will operate from a similar environment. So we need to think through uh, properly and probably our voice needs to be heard and our thoughts need to be seen in this guidance. The second mm -hmm. issue is about uh, that uh, Lisa brought it out. In terms of numbers, I think we stand at uh, 23 cases as of last month in Nairobi alone. And this is brutality by police. The whole of yesterday, we spent running around just following up one case of a defender who was brutalized by police uh, the day before yesterday, then the whole of yesterday, they were running up and down. So in terms of police brutality, not just because of curfew, but how they are managing uh, COVID-19, it is with a lot of brutality. For those who watched news yesterday, there was a case where a woman was tied uh, by an officer, it is claimed, on a motorbike, and he rode the motorbike pulling the woman for close to 20 kilometers, uh, sorry, I think 20 meters 
and by the time and and people are taking so one of the things i think we need to we need to change the way we are dealing with issues during covid you can't be taking a video where a woman is being pulled by a police officer and all of you are just watching finally on the question mm. of uh, donations and when we shall yes i want to agree with lisa uh because of accountability and transparency many people are not willing to donate food to the designated body because chances are the food will not reach the intended people and we had a case of one informal settlement where our minister for interior flagged off food donation meant to go to that community and then um, uh, three weeks down the line we go on media members of community indicating that the food that had been flagged off had not actually gotten to them so what what is happening is that people are coming together organizing themselves and going to donate food to those communities working with networks of people that they believe in so we have cbos that are coordinating like in our case i'm in a group where we come together as women five women and we are calling ourselves women to women initiative we collect food from amongst ourselves and donate the food to another group of women mothers and women human rights defenders of victims of police brutality and we have had opportunity to share food with them for 3 months now without commotion when you approach your donation through networks of women networks of cbos then you make, you are sure that this food will get to the intended uh uh community members and i can name a number of groupings that are, have used this approach and food has been getting to community members so lisa in case you have friends who would want to donate i would advise that they can work with community groups that are already organized because these groups are able to identify who within the community actually needs this food they are doing mapping they are sharing this information there are times when they decide today we are going to share food with people living with disabilities and that is the approach they are taking others are saying we are sharing food with people who are living uh, who are elderly within our community and that is the approach they are taking so alma mm -hmm. those are some of the thoughts i would wish to share Thank you. Those are great interventions. And maybe, um, you know, as a follow up, um, Salome, uh, some of the information you provided around the community groups might be something we could communicate out when we send out the uh, taped webinar as well. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm seeing that um, there's a few people that I've not yet heard from um, that are on the call. One of them is, uh, I believe it's Levi. Um, and Levi, if you're still on the line, would you like to um, share your thoughts? Can you hear me? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Um, I don't really have much to say. I just uh, uh, more of listening and uh, hearing out the experience. I work with Lisa, so uh, okay. Whatever we, yeah, whatever yeah. we have. Uh, said just represents uh, my thoughts and what we're working with uh, at the moment yeah thanks okay thank you yeah. and and janet um janet can you hear me you're you're also on the line i want to make sure that you have an opportunity to also share your thoughts are you there janet hello hi yes i can yes I'm fine. yes we can. would you yeah, like to share okay. anything Yes, I'm from Kenya, Bungoma. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hello, everyone. We can yeah, hear you. We are, working with the, we are working with people who are living with HIV AIDS, and the challenge is that because of the COVID-19, these people fear accessing services from the facilities because Facilities are seen as a source of COVID-19 because that's where people are tested and uh, kept for treatment. 
So most people fear to go to facilities to access services, and this means uh, a dear range of people when they are this is a challenge. Then also we are living along the Great North Rift where we have truck drivers and uh, we are on the where the stopping points like Webuye, Kandui uh, along the Malaba Road. So we are fearing uh, most of the communities are going to be affected by the coronavirus because the truck drivers interact with these people and they exchange money when they are buying goods. So that's a major challenge we are experiencing around here, working with the population. And uh, for the people who are living with HIV AIDS, most of them do manual jobs like washing clothes. And because of the COVID-19, they can no longer do the same jobs. So taking ARVs on empty stomachs is also a challenge. So it brings about a problem people accessing drugs or even if they have drugs then taking them to ensure that they are here so that is the challenge we are facing thank you thank you very much so some some you know some obviously some major um challenges that are um that are on top of already um serious work that's being being done to address issues like HIV. Very, uh, very important to be bringing that into this picture. Um, I also see that there is a person, uh, Aliyah is on the line. Aliyah, did you want to ask anything or, or make any interventions? And um, and there's also Diane. And Diane, did you want to to share any thoughts? Oh, Elia, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Eileen. I've been following, and it has been an interesting uh, experience since I've been following on the webinar. I, I'm from Pakistan. I'm working for NCA Pakistan, and we I was discussing that uh, in urban settings we can be uh, coordinating with each other through webinars. But for rural settings in Pakistan, our community part, uh, our partners in the community are also taking, um, making the communities sensitize, uh, doing sensitization and other related, uh, whatever they um, can do uh, through WhatsApp group. So through WhatsApp group, they are also monitoring cases of um, uh, gender-based violence as well and as they, they are also giving uh, protection how, well, how to protect themselves so this is my t um, input from Pakistan and uh, there are of course uh, we had a way the, the COVID-19 has been a blessing in disguise for a small number of minority groups um, in sin earlier uh, the their men were the only uh, breadwinners of the family Due to COVID and lockdown situation, the men were uh, con uh, within the households. W our part of what they had done is that they had uh, given them um, stitching, stitching and tailoring um, trainings. And through stitching and tailoring um, uh, training, they got the opportunities of opportunities of making cloth uh, masks. So that is the only source of earning for a family of seven to eight members. So there are within the constraints, within the problems, then the, people, the community themselves come up with solutions. We need to encourage the communities what they can come up because they are the ones who can practically, practically come up with practical solutions within their local context. Thank you. Thank you, Aliyah. Thank you for coming from all the way in Pakistan and connecting to Kenya. And I think the um, the uh, the point that was raised earlier on this on this call, and you just repeated it, the the importance of the rural areas of other forms of technology um, to make sure to make sure that there's connectivity and and to also look at ways in which communities can be responsive and and address needs and and issues. Um, using WhatsApp groups seems to be um, something that is, you know, it sounds simple and straightforward, but it's, uh, it's amazing how much that can be um, something that people can rely on. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Diane is also on the line. I know, Diane, you're a colleague of uh, Salome. Would you like to share anything?
uh, and if not, what I would like to do is say is turn um, our conversation a little bit to what next um, in terms of the ways in which we come out of the COVID crisis. Um, we and you know all you know all signs are pointing that this is still going to be a long uh, road ahead of us. We you know it feels like it's already been two years these last three months. So. Um, I know that all of you probably feel the same way that more has been more has happened in the last three months than I think we've seen in sometimes in a whole years. Um, but this is going to be something that we're going to be grappling with for some time now, um, particularly if um, if the experts are correct and we don't have a vaccine to to address the virus. Um, so we have to be thinking about new ways of coming out of the of this and for our organizations to, to be sustained um, and to be able to continue to do the good work that we need to do. And as some of you have pointed out, to be cognizant of the fact that these social justice issues that already existed uh, continue to exist and, and indeed um, sometimes are exacerbated uh, by the additional crisis that we have in front of us. So what is it that we, we need to be mindful of? What is it that we collectively could do together um, as, a, as a unique sort of uh, set of graduates and partners? Um, what's the opportunities that you think might exist um, for continuing to have conversations and for collaborating with one another? Um, mindful that we're all coming from very different sectors and environments and obviously geographic spaces. So Salome, I'm gonna turn back to you to kind of open up that conversation and see then if we have any, um, any comments from, from the participants on the line today. All right. Uh, I think one of the things we need to do, um, so taking that feedback we've received about rural and urban, we need to have uh, our, our WhatsApp group very active. I know you already have a WhatsApp group called Kenya Kodi alumni. I'm not sure all of us are in it. So uh, just to let us know if you're not in the Kodi Kenya alumni WhatsApp group, it would be important to join because I think this will be a platform where we can be sharing uh, trends of what we are seeing happening in our counties, uh, sharing what the directives actually mean when it comes to applicability because we know directives are being issued uh, every other day by our national government, by our county government. So it would be important for us to share what these directives are translating to at the community level. I think it would also be important for us, either individually or collectively, just think of doing uh, a survey or a study to just check uh, what the impact is actually uh, is like in terms of uh, COVID. We need to continue engaging. It could be webinars like this uh, done at a, a, a national level by the alumni members. But I think it is also important to have an active database of where we are and what we are doing so that we can create synergy. And I'm looking at uh, a debate on uh, the two-part gender rule in Kenya. This is a debate that has gone on forever. And I'm sure it is going to come up again in 2022 as we head into our elections. And it is an area that we could take lead in as an alumni. How do we ensure we get the two-third gender rule passed in Kenya so that then we stop operating the way we are doing. We should be monitoring that uh, women get equal opportunities because our constitution has given us that opportunity. And of course, we need to give visibility to each other's work. Like I'm hearing today that uh, we have people who are working with persons with disabilities, children for that matter, and how do we bring our efforts together? and probably jointly be having an alumni, uh, it could be annual event as alumni members. But I think this webinar has opened an opportunity for us of things we can do during COVID times, but also things that we can do post COVID. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. You raised the the important point of the of the elections, which seem like they're far away, but we know will come very quickly um, in 2022. And you've mentioned, of course, the the issue around quotas for women in particular, and looking at the getting um, getting some real action behind it. Have we? I've watched the last, I would say, three elections in Kenya, and the the amazing efforts that were put in um, into um, trying to ensure women's um, active participation and women's election in those. And while there were some gains, it seems to me that it continues to be fraught with so many challenges again. And, and again, violence against women is such a, a major issue when it comes to the election period. Uh, you've also, I know, um, uh, experienced conflict in general around the elections. And so one of the things that, you know, we talked about Salome a little bit is how do we get ahead of that? How do we how do we try to bring in more effective conflict prevention measures that that can um, reduce the possibilities for violence? Especially if, you know, if things um, in Kenya, like around the world, are, you know, are additionally um, affected by you know, the outcomes of the pandemic economically, socially, politically. Um, and what is that, what might that lead to when it comes to an election period? So a lot of work um, that could be done. And I really appreciate some of the suggestions that you've made um, around an alumni engagement with each other. And Cody's here to support. We can try to to um, to help with any of those, those um, those suggested um, mechanisms, but we really want to make sure this is coming from from you as graduates that you're seeing the value add, um, and that there is a, there's some meaningful reasons and connections for this to happen. I, you know, again, if it's not community led, um, then it you know there's there's not a whole lot uh, that you know can be done. So. Um, I'm going to open it back up to others um, on the call um, for last thoughts about collaboration together. Um, I cannot see raised hands, so I'm going to ask you to just jump in by turning your mic on. Um, and if you've got any last thoughts you want to make, uh, Jacqueline, did I see you turn your mic on? Do you want to start? Yes, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, for me, being in media, I also be. Okay, if uh, media is a powerful means of passing information and it's also the mirror of the society. So coming from the media, I would also want to add my colleague, they can come over if they want to pass any information. If they want uh, their message to go out there in large numbers, I'm um, very available to provide that platform for my colleague. So very, very ready to collaborate with everyone else to showcase the beautiful work you are doing during this period and even after this. That's a great offer, Jackie, and, uh, and uh, using your assets and your connections would be a wonderful thing to do. Dolphine, I see your hand is raised. Do you want, would you like to jump in? Go ahead, Dolphine, you can take your mute off, yeah. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, this has been a very wonderful discussion and uh, uh, feedback that uh, uh, Salome talked about, uh, sharing with the rest of the alumni and all that, I think that is a good way forward. But when you're looking at all this, we also have to factor in the issue of mental health, especially for, I mean, the post-COVID uh, period. When you look elderly members of the society who are sort of now because of the physical distancing and social distancing there's that element of loneliness in their lives so we also have to factor in the factor i mean the, the mental health of such and then also working with students the mental health of students you know like right now most of them are doing online classes you find they spent lots of hours on the screen and uh, sometimes the internet is very unstable so they feel like they're missing out they've got to hand in assignments in time and all that there's a lot of pressure from everywhere so the other day i really have 
I experienced somebody in my house actually shedding tears because she could not hand in her assignment in time. The internet connectivity was very unstable. So I'm just like, this thing is a bit too much for these students. So as much as we're talking about being online, technology and all that, we also have people working at, uh, it, it must be something that we must be very aware with the communities. And then there's a lot to be done, as I've listened to everybody, there's so, so much to be done. And sometimes we may end up spreading ourselves too thin. So if we come together and collaborate, we find that as alumni or alumni, maybe please, and we spread ourselves too thin. And then we also have to look at our own mental health. So that is uh, collaboration is key. Collaboration is key. Thank you. Thank you so much, Delphine. And I'm just reading in the chat from, from Lisa that she had received an announcement from the National Council for, Pers for Persons with Disabilities to register for a COVID support program. So she's gonna share that also with the with this group and uh, and uh, and so, okay, now she says, sorry, I'm just reading through her stuff, and now she says, just shared it, and somebody said it was fake. Apologies. Okay. So, anyways, but that actually is a good point, um, Lisa. If, if any of you feel like there is information that the network of graduates should be getting or receiving, and you're not certain that they are, then maybe, again, um, we can think about how that your WhatsApp group might be that way of sharing information that could be relevant especially as we get to know some, some of what each other is doing. Um, I think what I could commit from Cody's side is that we, we have a hard look at the list of, uh, of graduates that are located in Kenya. I know there is a lot um, that signed up for the call today, but either weren't able to join um, or they're, they're looking forward to listening to this recording. Um, so I think there's going to be some follow-up conversation that could happen. And, I will um, certainly ask um, Kate to work with me to reach out to those graduates to make sure that they, they watch this video and they also think about what ways they, they would consider collaboration for the moving forward. Um, and, you know, Jackie's point is quite right. And, you know, maybe my final point here will be to say the mental health issue is going to be a big issue. It is a big issue now and it's, it's an issue everybody's facing. Um, it's wonderful in many ways um, that the COVID pandemic has, you know, had a silver lining in that we've been able to do these kinds of calls with all of you and reconnect with alumni um, where you've had connectivity. Um, and it's always such a wonderful thing to do that. And we can't travel all the time to Kenya. So for me, it's wonderful to be able to connect with you. But it's also a lot. And people, you know, it's, you know, if I, if I think about Kenyan society. Um, I know also that um, you know you're a very social, uh, social society. That it's not natural to be sitting in in bubbles at home and and just trying to talk on the computer. And this is going to this is obviously had a, a huge impact in terms of also separation of families and being able to to travel and be mobile and and to visit and to do all the things that we. We like to do with our friends and family. So I, I take the point, Dolphine, you've raised uh, uh, around mental health and what is it that coming out of it we need to do. So you know, in 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 my in for closing from my side, um, you know what we we have these these two questions that are now up on the screen. Um, it, you know, is this just another um, humanitarian crisis that we're facing, a health crisis? Or is this actually the, you know, the start of something quite transformative? Is this a transformative moment for the world in terms of the way we want to work together, the way that we operate um, together? Um, and it's not a question to be answered here, but it's definitely a question that is going on in our heads um, at Cody, and I'm sure all, you know, in all of our minds about what will this mean for the world post pandemic what what will it mean for 
addressing community um, community development and so and social justice issues. Um, so, so Salome, I'm going to turn to you for your final thoughts as we wrap up this webinar. I I was tempted to actually respond to the first one because I have chosen to look at COVID not as a crisis but as an opportunity for us to learn. And I've been asking myself, what are some of the lessons that I'm drawing from this pandemic? And one obvious question, uh, one obvious answer that is coming and it keeps on coming to my mind is that it is an opportunity for me to change the way I do my things. One obvious thing is that I can't go out to the field yet problems are still there to be addressed. So how do I need to start doing things differently? And immediately then I embrace the question of flexibility and this flexibility cannot afford to be one way, it has to be two way, where organizations are flexible enough to work with communities the way communities deal fit. Funding partners have to be flexible enough to allow those organizations they fund to do the work in a manner that would ensure that they deliver what they committed to deliver. So to all of us, I would urge, if possible, let us not look at this pandemic as a crisis, but ask ourselves, what lessons are we learning? How do we start applying those lessons to deal with the pandemic now, but also to deal with the situations post the pandemic? So that should we find ourselves in a similar situation anytime soon, we will be able to handle it better than we are handling the COVID-19 now. And I think mm -hmm. for me, if we learn, then any challenge that comes to us as women we will be able to handle it better. Thank you, Aileen. And thank you everyone for joining us today and for sharing the experiences, but of importance, sharing how you are dealing with the situation. I have carried a point or two that I will try to apply in my work with defenders on a daily basis. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Salome. And I think what we uh, will do now is say goodbye for now. Um, we look forward to connecting with you in the coming weeks. Um, we will share the recording with everybody. And it's been a real pleasure chatting with you today. And if, um, if we get other feedback from Kenyan graduates, um, we will be certain to also share that along as well um, and continue the rich discussion around how we can collaborate moving forward. So thank you very much, everybody, and have a great afternoon and great evening. Take good care of yourselves. Stay healthy. Stay well. Thank you.